thanks so much, Aaron uh, and Jen and, and Jeremy, the new president, for putting this event on. It's great to have a forum uh, to discuss Sean Gebser's work. Um, certainly, a, he had a major impact on me uh, as, a, as a college undergraduate. I think similar to Jeremy, I stumbled across his book uh, in the basement floor of my university at the University of Central Florida. And when I began to read it, I was surprised that such a book would be in this library. But um, Gebser was an important figure getting me started on this adventure, uh, understanding the full sweep of, of human history and understanding our moment. So um, I'm very pleased to be here today to speak at the Gebser conference for the first time. It's amazing that there have been 45 of these uh, every year for 45 years. Maybe no, the, the numbering is a little askew because it, it, <laughs> was, it was incorporating both the European meeting and the American right. meeting, I and see. the number system, uh, so it's actually 23rd well, year. If not in a quantitative sense, it's just a qualitative sense. Yeah, but in dog years, we're in the last year. So uh, the title of my talk is The Interrupted Eruption of Time towards an integral cosmology with help from Bergson and Whitehead. This is towards an integral cosmology. This isn't the integral cosmology. Um, I think that would require having more than uh, a German, a Frenchman, and uh, an Englishman. Um, <laughs> it would require women. It would require the global south, Africa, uh, Middle East, etc. So we're moving towards this. And um, I'm trying to provide us with a few insights from these thinkers who I have immersed myself in, and um, so the fact that I'm drawing on these thinkers has more to do with my own history and lineage than it does to do with uh, you know, the, the borders between what's integral and what's not. So we certainly need to continue uh, including as many voices as we can in this project. So I'm going to start by just reading a few lines here from the book that got us all here. Um, Gebser's ever present origin. Um, Gebser uses this phrase, the eruption of time, several times uh, in this book, and I want to give us a sense for what he's talking about there. So he says, this is 287, um, the completely novel foundations of the new theories in science and um, of the means of expression in the arts, so these new, uh, new expressions in, in science and in art, rest on the inclusion of the time factor into the rigid, materialistic, and spatially conceived systems prevalent until 1900. Yet the incorporation of time into our reality is far from complete. Even today, there are far-reaching attempts being made toward understanding the phenomenon of time. We have designated these attempts as temporic attempts. These endeavors, and again, we are only giving an initial orientation, have shown extremely confusing results. It is not merely coincidental that we speak of an eruption of time into our consciousness. We are confronted here with the eruption of the fourth dimension into the three-dimensional world, which in its first outburst shatters the three-dimensional world. In physics, the eruption of time has brought the threat of the ultimate destruction of matter and space, as demonstrated by the atomic bomb. This is a picture of the Trinity explosion, the first detonation of a nuclear bomb in 1945. Um, Gebser continues, in discussing this question, we should not ignore the fact that there are intimations of the subsequent eruption of time into the three-dimensional world, uh, world conception, during the three generations preceding Einstein. It was Einstein's theory of relativity which invalidated the previous exclusive claim of the Copernican world system and replaced it with the so-called space-time continuum. As a consequence, we can no longer conceive of the world as being infinite and unbounded, but rather finite yet unbounded. We are obliged, in other words, to realize not only a totally new uh, perception of reality that is diametrically opposed to the previous conception, but we are also compelled to become fully conscious of time, the new component, not just as a physical, geometrical fourth dimension, but in its full complexity. Um, 
So Gebster here specifically mentions physics and art as, uh, and he mentions the other sciences, psychology and um, biology as well, as um, sites wherein this eruption of time is occurring. And I know Gebster um, speaks about philosophy as an arena that um, is, is restricted to uh, the mental structure of consciousness, it's obsessed with system and so on. But I think um, when you look at philosophers like Bergson and Whitehead, uh, they are doing philosophy in a way that um, at times is systematic, but at other times has more to do with imaginative art. And that's what Whitehead's de definition of philosophy is, imaginative art um, that is in conversation with the sciences. And I think I would want to preserve a form of, of philosophy that isn't so much limited to building systems, uh, abstract um, conceptions of or models of the world, um, and it isn't so much concerned with uh, trying to represent the world. It's not a form of representational philosophy, which Gebser critiques as well. Um, it's rather a participatory form of philosophy. It's inactive, um, where there's not this sense of a, um, a dualism between the knowing subject and the known objects that has characterized so much of philosophy during the mental structure of consciousness. Um, so I think there are efforts at uh, what, what Gebser calls temporics, um, also within philosophy. And that's what I'm going to talk about here um, in the context of Bergson and, and Whitehead's work. Um, so Gebser mentions in this, in this excerpt that I read that these efforts to bring time uh, into our consciousness have been confusing. Uh, and anyone who has studied relativity and quantum theory, um, these theories uh, will attest to this confusion. There are all sorts of paradoxes that challenge our normal, uh, linear, everyday uh, intuitions about the nature of causality, um, the nature of time. Um, Gebser says that they shatter, that these new conceptions in relativity and quantum theory shatter our 3D consciousness. Um, And he, he says that our fathers, dominated by the mental structure, had no sensorium for the phenomenon of time. They lived in a spatially frozen world. They considered the temporal world to be a disturbing factor which was repressed, either by being ignored or by being falsified into a spatial component. So Gebser describes um, this, this period basically for the last century or so, since around 1900, um, as uh, a period in which time is trying to erupt into our consciousness, but there are various efforts to repress it. And as we'll see, even Einstein, whose new theory of relativity brought a new understanding of time into physics, was also, uh, as Gebser here says, falsely spatializing time. Um, and in a way was continuing the same sort of Cartesian um, approach to, to the physical world that would map it out onto a grid work, which just added another dimension. Uh, to the Cartesian grid and called it time, but this is really another dimension of space. Um, and concrete time, qualitative time, uh, has been repressed in that, in that understanding. Um, so this is the interrupted eruption of time that I'm trying to get at here, that despite the emergence of the consciousness of time, not only in physics, but in psychology, Gebser refers to the, the emergence of the notion of the unconscious and the the, the collective unconscious, this deep, deep historical inheritance um, that our conscious psyche is largely unaware of, but that is nonetheless influencing our behavior and our thoughts, um, that this is another example of the eruption of time. Um, the theory of evolution, uh, Darwin's theory, the, uh, Lyle's theory of, of, of geology and the, the deep history of the earth that's, that's rushing into human consciousness in the, in the 19th century. Um, all of these are examples of um, uh, the way that the time element has overwhelmed our consciousness. And now it's 2015, um, and the Gregorian calendar system, which is another kind of uh, arbitrary mental invention that perhaps needs to be reconsidered. But, um, you know, we're almost 200 years into this period when the, the, the time element is erupting into our consciousness, and we're still confused about how to integrate it. Um, so, 
again, time's full complexity, as Gebser says, has been repressed and reduced um, to mere clock time. And what we see in, in Einstein's work is um, a reduction of time to measurement and a confusion of concrete time with, with measurable time. Um, and the thing about uh, clocks that we use to measure time is that they too are aging. So to really be accurate, you'd need to make sure with another clock that the clock you're using to measure the physical processes is accurate. And then you need another clock to make sure that one's accurate. And you know, Whitehead talks about this issue of measurement that uh, you can't have an infinite regress of instruments to measure uh, the measuring instrument to make sure that it's correct and accurate. So at some point, we, we just take this leap of intuition that um, these instruments are measuring something objective, but really um, we're trying to capture what Gebser refers to as a qualitative intensity in terms of uh, measurable quantities. And you can't do that. Um, and the, the danger when we try to do that is, um, you know, the atom bomb being uh, sort of a, a, a a result of what happens when this new time component is falsely understood and is applied in a just merely technological sense with no understanding um, of the sort of energies that are being tampered with. So it's very important uh, that we become conscious of the time element and its full complexity. So, as Gebser says, the eruption of time is destructive only if we fail to realize what time is. It need not be a loss of shelter and security, but rather, it can be a liberation. So, one of the other symptoms of the repression of the time element in our contemporary society is a feeling of anxiety, a loss of shelter, a loss of insecurity, um, boredom. I think boredom and anxiety are these, are these two um, sort of uh, psychological ailments that uh, each of us is constantly at, at risk of falling falling into boredom, also leading into depression, anxiety also um, manifesting as depression. A lot of us have uh, a strong internal sense and desire that we want to make a change in the world, but we're powerless to do so. We're, we're anxious, we're rushing around in our modern lives, busy with no time to, no time, right? And Gebser says, those of us who say, I have no time, what we're really saying is, I have no soul. I have no life. Right? So, let's talk about this man, Einstein. Um, his special theory of relativity really shattered the old Newtonian conception of absolute space and absolute time. What he came up with uh, was a way of uh, again, measuring time as if it were a spatial uh, dimension, right? So you have the old Cartesian grid, the x, y, and z axes, three-dimensional space. And uh, Einstein looked at this and using some equations from um, the German physicist Lorentz, uh, you know, he, he adds this, this time dimension, uh, the fourth dimension, so-called. And what he recognized is that there is no absolute um, sense of, of time and space. That there are multiple space-time systems that overlap in various ways. And so if that's the case, how do we maintain a sense of causality? How do we maintain a sense of the laws of physics if no two observers agree uh, about you know, the order of two events or the order of one event? Um, well, with the Lorentz equations, you can take two of these space-time systems, uh, each with their own you know, space-time or uh, world lines, and because Einstein posited that the speed of light is a constant for all observers, you can then link these two systems with, uh, it's not, I mean, it's complicated for me, but it, for a mathematician, it's basically a equation I hope, um, so that the laws of causality still pay. Um, this is based on the postulate that the speed of light is constant. When you actually measure the speed of light, uh, it's never quite the same speed. So this is a way that science uses, um, you know, it, 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 it reduces the full complexity of nature, which has elements of chaos and change and, and um, unpredictability. And, it, and in order to get it to be mathematizable, um, 
we just posit that the speed of light is, is the same for all observers, um, 300 meters per second, I think, right? Um, 300,000 meters per second. So this is Einstein's breakthrough on the special theory of relativity, and it leads to various paradoxes. Um, maybe you've heard of the twin paradox. Uh, this idea where there are two twins, exact same age, one stays on the Earth, one flies on a rocket ship at near the speed of light, turns around and comes back. Um, the, the person on Earth has aged uh, hundreds of years, whereas the person who was traveling on the rocket ship has aged maybe a year. Um, the paradox here comes, I mean, it's strange enough already, but the paradox here within special relativity is that gravity is not taken into account, acceleration is not taken into account. So it, it, it's just as true to say that it wasn't the rocket ship that was moving, it was the Earth that was moving in the opposite direction. Because motion is, and space are relative, right? Later, in 1916, when Einstein developed the general theory of relativity, he incorporates gravity and acceleration, and this paradox is somewhat resolved. But we're still left with this sense of, um, of time as being totally contrary to our intuitions. We have an intuition of simultaneity, that each of us right now is sharing this moment together. There's a, uni a unity of our, of our becoming. Um, but Einstein's theory is denying that. He's saying that each of you is in my past um, and that I have to wait for light to come to me. And, you know, Whitehead doesn't want to deny that, but he reconceives of the meaning of this finite speed of light in what I would say is a more integral context that doesn't reject our common sense intuitions, but that is, is rooted in our common sense intuitions. And for Whitehead, if, if uh, the abstractions of physics are in conflict with our everyday experience, um, we need to reconsider those abstractions and recognize them as abstractions instead of saying that that's the nature of reality. So another person who was critical of, of not Einstein's scientific theory, but his philosophical interpretation of his theory uh, was, was this man, um, Henri Bergson. And in 1922, these two had a debate in Paris. Um, and it wasn't just a debate about the nature of time, it was also, you know, this is in between the two world wars. Bergson was the head of this international organization, um, a version of which would eventually become the UN, and they were trying to establish an international network of scientists uh, to, to combat the, the, the rising tides of war and, and the run up to the second world war. Um, Einstein was aware of the potential, based on his E equals MC squared equation, that atomic weapons were feasible, that they could be made, um, and was beginning to communicate to scientists in the United States and the US government that you know Germany might be working on this. So there's a whole political um, backdrop to this meeting, and Einstein had just become famous in 1919 after this uh, eclipse uh, proved that indeed light is bent by gravity. Um, Whitehead himself was present at the Royal Society when um, Arthur Eddington brought back this plate, the phot photographic plate that showed this evidence and describes the scene uh, as, as like a, a Greek drama where the laws of nature, where fate was revealed to the scientists and it was just this really luminous moment uh, as a mathematical theory conceived by Einstein in an armchair was shown to correspond on some level to the nature of reality. So, you know, it's not as though there's a, that, that Bergson or Whitehead are completely rejecting Einstein. They're just trying to distinguish between the abstractions of science and physics uh, and, you know, a wider cosmological picture that would include, in an integral fashion, um, human consciousness, not just as a byproduct or epiphenomenon, um, but as integral to the entire um, evolutionary cosmogenetic process. So these two debated um, in 1922 about precisely this issue, uh, whether or not, or not physics, and in particular Einstein's new relativity physics, was the final word on the nature of time. Bergson said, no, you're talking about measurable time, physical time. And there's another form of time that is more real which I think it's unfortunate he, he put it this way, but he called it psychological time. And Einstein's response, you know, psychological time is the time that endures, the time that 
is what William James called the specious present. It's, it's not an instantaneous uh, you know, snap of the fingers, it's a duration. The past flows into it, it's inherited. The future, uh, in the present moment, it, it opens up to the future, um, at very, looking at various possibilities that haven't yet been actualized. Um, that for Bergson is psychological time, or concrete time, you might say. Whereas Einstein's understanding of time was a series of instants. It's not clear inter uh, exactly how one instant would follow the other, um, because again, there's, there's no depth to those instants. So for the past to be included and the, and the future to be included, each in their own way in the present, it's not clear how that could be possible in this instantaneous notion of time. And you know, ultimately, Einstein would say that time is but a stubbornly persistent illusion. The time of our experience is but a stubbornly persistent illusion. And really, in that fourth dimension, that falsely spatialized fourth dimension that he called time, but really it's just a fourth dimension of space, all of the future and all of the past coexist in this kind of block. So it's a deterministic picture. There is no creativity. There's no creative advance of nature, as Whitehead would describe it. Um, there's just this four-dimensional space-time block in which all events have already happened. And our perception is just what, you know, um, at the beginning of the scientific revolution, Galileo would have called a secondary characteristic. It's a mere psychic addition, psychological addition or projection upon what is really a material mechanistic system for which time, as we understand it, doesn't exist at all. Um, so, Later in 1922, after this debate, um, Whitehead wrote his own book on relativity theory. Um, he wrote a series of books that were really a response to Einstein's interpretation of, of this theory. And what he really wanted to protest against, as he said, is this so-called bifurcation of nature between a psychological and a physical time. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, with Bergson, someone who's, who's truly a genius, and, and I'll, I'll wrap up. Oh, thanks. Um, I'll wrap up uh, with a beautiful quote from Bergson, who's such a beautiful writer, um, that he, in his debate with Einstein, fell into this kind of um, dualistic compromise where uh, he distinguished between um, these two modes of consciousness that human beings have. The intellect, which is all about um, dominating objects in three-dimensional space. Um, it's it's the, the, the cognitive faculty used by science. And on the other hand, you have intuition. It's what artists and Bergsonian philosophers use to understand the nature of reality as a, as a creative becoming, right? So intuition plugs us into real time for Bergson, whereas intellect spatializes. And um, what Bergson wanted to say is, go ahead, Einstein, do your physics and your science using intellect, and create your model of reality using intellect. But in reality, what's really going on um, is through this intuitive way of knowing, we can grasp that all of reality is a continuous becoming. Um, and it's a fair compromise, but I think in seeding um, nature, basically, to the sciences, um, Bergson loses an opportunity to reconceive science in a non-mechanistic, uh, organic way, and that's Whitehead's project. Not to settle for this sort of truce, which Einstein didn't accept, but this truce that would say, you know, science can, you can, you can spatialize time all you want, but really over here, we philosophers know that time is not like that. Einstein, uh, Whitehead wanted to say, no, we can, reform science, we can transform science, um, and rest it on a more organic world conception. Um, and for Whitehead, um, this involves a protest against the bifurcation of nature, first of all. Um, so he says, what I'm essentially protesting against is the bifurcation of nature into two systems of reality, which, insofar as they are real, are real in different senses, namely, the bifurcation of nature into the nature apprehended in awareness and the nature which is said to be the cause of awareness. The nature which is the fact apprehended in awareness holds within it the greenness of the trees, the song of the birds, the warmth of the sun, the hardness of the chairs, 
in the feel of the velvet. The nature which is the cause of awareness is the conjectured system of molecules and electrons which so affects the mind so as, uh, as to produce the awareness of apparent nature. Thus, there would be two natures, one the conjecture and the other the dream. This is the incoherence of this um, modern mechanistic attempt to come to terms um, with this eruption of time. We end up with a conjectured physical world that according to the epistemology guiding scientists like Einstein's work, we only are become aware of because of our sensory experience, which is the experience of the mind. And so it's just a conjecture out there that's separate from us. Um, and then in that context are the experience of poets and artists is but a dream. It's just an internal um, you know, construct. So the way that Whitehead tries to reform science is by getting rid of this old Cartesian, Galilean, Newtonian, and even Einsteinian notion of nature uh, composed of point instants. It's the mathematization and the geometrization of nature um, into these abstractions called point instants. Um, Whitehead says these don't exist in nature. Nature is composed of what he calls actual occasions, actual occasions of experience. So he's, he's a pan-psychist or pan-experientialist because he thinks experience, not necessarily consciousness in the way that human beings experience it, but a sort of non-conscious experience, if you will, or basic feeling, goes all the way down to the level of photons and electrons. Photons and electrons, Whitehead describes as organisms. They're self-organizing beings that inherit a past and anticipate a future. So like Bergson, Whitehead's conception of time has depth to it. Um, it at each moment is inheriting the entire past of our universe. All the habits that have built up in the past are inherited in the present. And each moment of experience is open to um, a set of infinite possibilities graded uh, as they're relevant to, to our moment based on our past, right? So the present is including future possibilities, past actualities, and concressing that is Whitehead's word. Concrescence is what's happening over and over and over again in this rhythmically, um, this rhythmic pulsation where time is, is um, the past is perpetually perishing as it opens to a novel future. Um, and the intricacies and the depth of this understanding of time and of the, the structure of each actual occasion as it concresses is, um, it's really complicated. So I can't get too into it now, but um, the basic idea is that there's this spread of the present that includes the past and the future. It's not an instant. Um, so one of the important features of, uh, of time and its full concreteness, as Gebser describes it, is that it's not simply the linear chronological time of the mental structure, it's not simply the cyclical time of the mythic, um, nor is it the episodic time of the magic. Uh, it is somehow transparent to all, of, all three of those um, modalities of temporality, um, but it, it allows us to avoid privileging either of the three. Um, and in some sense, I think this is a, an attempt to make um, the eternal and the temporal um, harmonize with one another, to make the eternal participate in time, and time participate in the eternal. Um, you know, certainly, I think our, our picture of the universe as an evolutionary, um, you know, creative advance is, is quite beautiful, um, but it, it seems quite linear, it seems like a, a mental picture. Some various people have brought up the way that Gebser is not an evolutionary thinker in that sense of evolution as a progress towards greater complexity because he sees the evolutionary, um, or at least this process of mutation through various structures as as much a regress as a progress. Um, but I think, you know, we can understand the history of our universe as 
incorporating elements of all three of those structures. Um, and Whitehead's understanding of time as concrescence helps us begin to do that um, in the way that you know each concrescence is a sort of episode that includes the entirety of the past in it. It's got that magical element where, in a sort of fractal way, um, the entire universe is included in each actual occasion's experience. Uh, there's a, a sort of um, ongoing synchronicity in each moment of concrescence. And the mythic dimension, um, I think, is, is, is also present in his understanding of the divine as a, as a, as a polarity. Um, which I can't get too much into here, uh, but his understanding of God is, is a, a divinity that's involved in the world and that sets the, the sort of primordial conditions that then guide all of the actual occasions of the world's uh, activities. And then God feels those, the, the decisions, the activities of actual occasions um, and, and um, is therefore uh, uh, suffering with them, he says, and involved in, in, in the ongoing evolution of the universe and maintaining that evolution, which is a chronological thing in the context of a mythic cycle uh, of God's sort of God's inner life. Um, so to wrap up here, this is a, a long quote that I think gets at what Whitehead is trying to do in incorporating the eternal and the temporal into one integral um, conception of truth. So he says, there are various contrasted qualities of temperament which control the formation of the mentalities of different epochs. Ideals fashion themselves around these two notions, permanence and flux. In the inescapable flux, there is something that abides. In the overwhelming permanence, there is an element that escapes into flux. Permanence can be snatched only out of flux, and the passing moment can find its adequate intensity only by its submission to permanence. Those who would disjoin the two elements can find no interpretation of patent facts. The four symbolic figures in the Medici Chapel in Florence, Michelangelo's masterpieces of statuary, day and night, evening and dawn, exhibit the everlasting elements in the passage of fact. The figures stay there, reclining in their recurring sequence, forever showing the essences and the nature of things. This is evening and dawn. Evening is the gentleman on the left, and dawn is on the right. Um, day and night, I think, were rushed, and I don't even think Michelangelo finished them, so I chose to show you these two. Um, so, you know, Whitehead is using this work of art, of statuary, as, uh, as an, an example of the way that um, these moments, dusk and dawn, um, while they're always passing, they seem to um, hint at something eternal. You know, maybe the platonic idea of beauty is manifest. And it doesn't last, it passes, but it's, it's, it's sort of in that, um, that in-between space, that indecision between whether it's eternal, whether it's temporal, that beauty um, manifests. Dwight Head continues, the perfect realization is not merely the exemplification of what an abstraction is timeless. It does more. It implants timelessness on what in its essence is passing. The perfect moment is fadeless in the lapse of time. Time has then lost its character of perpetual perishing. It becomes the moving image of eternity. Um, they're quoting um, Timaeus, Plato's dialogue character, and the dialogue Timaeus. So, I think to sum up then, you know, it's clear that um, Einstein was a genius who utilized imagination to, to, you know, ride on a beam of light and understand mathematically um, what it would mean for the speed of light to be constant to all observers. And um, he was intimating something larger than he could communicate to other mathematical physicists using the language that they are used to, to speaking about nature in terms of. And it's up to philosophers, I think, like Bergson, uh, like Whitehead, to begin to um, 
you know, as Whitehead says, critique the abstractions of the specialized sciences, that that's philosophy's role, and to make uh, our understanding of, of the physical universe uh, compatible with our understanding of our experience as psychological beings. Not in the way that Bergson did through this, this sort of, um, you know, truce ceding all this territory to science and, and protecting the inner subjective experience of human beings, but by really revisioning our entire cosmology, revisioning um, the metaphysical substructure of science itself, replacing the old mechanistic paradigm of the deficient mental structure with an organic paradigm suitable to a more integral uh, consciousness. Um, so I think if I have any time left, I'll engage in conversation with all of you. So thanks for listening. show up to work at 9 a.m. and I love getting off at 5 p.m. so I have to look at the clock but uh, you know I try not to allow myself to become overwhelmed by the sense of time slipping away and you know for me it, my livelihood is, is philosophy thinking um, and if there's any anxiety for example, Thinking becomes so repetitive and it just stalls out and it loses that creative flow. So it's crucial that um, you know, I'm able to, to cultivate a perception of time and its full concreteness and not get lost in calendars and clocks and, um, and the anxiety that comes with worrying about. Possibilities that each day might bring that I could never have expected. So to worry about what's going to happen is kind of silly. You never, you never so I think at an existential level is where this it starts to manifest. And it's certainly an ongoing practice. But thanks for trying to bring it back down to Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who is the figure seated above Dustin Bell? Good question. I think it's. Roman Sentinel or something. I'm not exactly sure what what he's up to. Maybe he's the one being shaken from his imperial consciousness by the beauty of dusk or dawn. I'm not sure. <laughs> Leslie, did you have a comment? Well, just that you maybe I misunderstood you, but I, I thought you promised a finishing quotation from Bergson. Oh, I did. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. This is from a late work of his called The Creative Mind. Um, and it's a kind of defense of philosophy, an integral form of philosophy, sort of leading back to what I said at the beginning of this talk. So he says, through philosophy we can accustom ourselves never to isolate the present from the past which it pulls along with it. Thanks to philosophy, all things acquire depth, more than depth, something like a fourth dimension which permits anterior perceptions to remain bound up with present perceptions, and the immediate future itself to become partly outlined in the present. Reality no longer appears, then, in the static state in its manner of being. It affirms itself dynamically in the continuity and variability of its tendency. What was immobile and frozen in our perception is warmed and set in motion. Everything comes to life around us. Everything is revivified in us. A great impulse carries beings and things along. We feel ourselves uplifted, carried away, borne along by it. We are more fully alive, and this increase of life brings with it the conviction that grave philosophical enigmas can be resolved, or even perhaps that they need not be raised, since they arise from a frozen vision of the real and are only the translation in terms of thought a certain artificial weakening of our vitality. In fact, the more we accustom ourselves to think 
and to perceive all things subspecies durationists, the more we plunge into real duration, real time. And the more we immerse ourselves in it, the more we set ourselves back in the direction of the principle, though it be transcendent, in which we participate, and whose eternity is not to be an eternity of immutability, but an eternity of life. How, otherwise, could we live and move in it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm the next speaker, so I'll just take uh, a moment of my own time <laughs> to uh, add, to, because he gave such a wonderful talk. Uh, I've read a fair amount about Bert Sumner, probably next to Bert Sumner, some of the one of my favorite uh, people of all time. Uh, but about the great debate with Einstein, my readings of it is that it was hardly a debate at all. They met for about 10, 15 minutes. After which Einstein went about telling everyone that Bergson didn't understand his math. Mm -hmm. This was a man who had won prizes in mathematics. Right. It's just that you get two people together, and one of them, Einstein, dismisses the others as there's no such thing as psychological time. That's a conversation stopper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and then, on top of that, there was this big effort to put together a World Congress of Science and Paris. They didn't even build a building for it. And Einstein, being the stubborn ass he was, <laughs> despite all the wonderful photographs of him on a bicycle, refused <laughs> to come. Yeah. So none of the Germans came. It was an end of it. I mean, this could have stopped the Second World War. <laughs> but Einstein wouldn't come, and the whole thing fell through. This was part of the, what was the organization before the United Nations that made a real effort. League of Nations. League of Nations. Yeah, it was part of the League of Nations. So, uh, that was a critical moment in history, and, and not, I don't think, a very good one for Einstein. Yeah. What yeah. was his reason for not coming? He didn't like Frenchmen. He didn't <laughs> like, no, I'm serious. He didn't like Bergson. Yeah. And he was insulted that Bergson didn't agree with him, and he, and he had a very nasty temper. Yeah. Read about his wife. Right. <laughs> I think it was. It wasn't much of a debate, you're right. I think no, was, no, was, was uh, Einstein was there to visit with the philosophers and scientists in Paris. And, and he had person. just become very famous and Einstein, it had gone yeah. to his head. Right. Yeah. 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 Do I have time for everyone? Yeah, go ahead because I'm next and we'll be happy for bombing. <laughs> <laughs> Or I can speak and stay here. No, I just wanted to thank you so much because it opened up a lot of good things I haven't thought about for a while. And um, just, uh, you know, remembering that Russell was also talking about psychological versus some absolute. Russell hated on Erickson, too. And then now I just saw a program, uh, maybe a new series on PBS that uh, focused on neuroscience and it's simplistic, but it was trying to basically reduce everything to cognitive psychological process and the whole the problems and all that. And I think that's where that's going. But I think where we might find some juice in this is to the connection between time and consciousness and bring in um Olivia and Gebser into this and what's between mental and integral and especially Olivia's several levels of um, mind that uh, which the first one, the physical mind is the only one that's connected to the brain. Where all the processing happens and, and stuff happens. But these other layers are, is, are all sort of experiences that are beyond time. That's neither a 100% objective time nor a reduced um, phenomenal time, cognitive processing induced. And so I think that expands the conversation. You know? yeah. so I wonder if you've thought about some of these issues. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Eric Weiss, who was going to be here, but got sick, uh, has done a lot of work bringing Whitehead and Arvindo into conversation with one another and sort of melding their um, view of re their views of reality into a very interesting um, picture where there are you know transphysical occasions of experience that aren't necessarily wed to particular organismic forms. Um, you know, I, I think many of us in this room have probably had experiences that could be interpreted as um, evidence for that type of view. Um, I think Whitehead doesn't 
I mean, obviously, based on the work that Eric was able to do to extend Whitehead, there's nothing in Whitehead's ontology that would prevent such interpretations, but he's sticking more with an interpretation of what science has revealed about the physical world. And it's an interpretation that is open to um, these more expansive, non-physical forms uh, of consciousness and expression. Um, so I think, yeah, that's a fruitful area for further inquiry. So I think we should probably move on.